Hi, I'm Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Volaction. This video is part of my lean training system. It was originally released as a DVD a long time ago, but times have changed and the look of some of these LTS videos is now a bit dated. The content is still spot on though. So rather than just discontinue the line, I am posting the majority of each of the 36 videos here with the remainder available at Volaction Videos. That's our video service where you can download a wealth of supporting content and watch subscriber only videos. I recommend subscribing and hitting the notification button if you want to make sure you don't miss any new content. I would also really appreciate if you would hit the like button if this video is helpful and you want to see more content similar to it. The like button helps us get found on YouTube, but it also lets us figure out where you want us to put our future effort. Now enjoy the free version of this video. Welcome to Volaction Continuous Improvement's overview presentation on FMEA or Failure Modes and Effects Analysis. I am Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Volaction. I've got two main takeaways for this presentation. The first is that I want you to gain an understanding of what FMEA is. The second is that I want you to gain clarity on how you can use FMEA to get a handle on your quality. Let's jump right into that first objective. FMEA is the process of taking a systematic look at how something might fail. It is normally, but not exclusively, done before product launches or major updates. It is traditionally an engineering function, but we see a lot of value in using this methodology to take a look at new processes that you set up during your continuous improvement efforts. There is one more thing I should mention here. Most people are not going to use the full name, failure mode, and effects analysis. You may hear people try to pronounce some version of the abbreviation as if it is a word. I tend to just prefer saying all the letters as FMEA. It tends to prevent confusion. Let's think about this in a very simple way. Imagine you make a very basic product like this field hockey ball. You may want to take an overall look at quality, so you think about all the different ways the ball might fail on you. It might melt. It might crack in half. Chunks might fall off of it. It may become discolored. It might be out of round. You'd probably think about how big of a problem each defect would be. In the scheme of things, you might disrupt a game, but nobody is going to die. You might also think about how likely each of these is to happen. It probably isn't going to melt. It might crack or discolor if there's a bad batch of materials. If a mold has a problem, it might not be a perfect sphere. You might then think about how hard it would be to tell if the balls were coming off of the production line with defects. Those are the three factors included in FMEA, severity, occurrence, and detection. Of course, a hard rubber field hockey ball is pretty simple with low risk. But not all products are so easy to look at. An airplane has a significantly larger number of potential serious problems, and they could be catastrophic. They might happen much more frequently than ball problems. And they might be a lot harder to detect. The point is that some products have a much, much greater need for quality management than others. That's where FMEA comes in. I hope you are getting something valuable out of this video. If you want to get more out of this program, we recommend watching it on Volaction videos. You'll be able to watch the entire video, mostly ad-free, and view subscriber-only programs. You'll also have access to a load of continuous improvement downloads. Let's go over the process for using FMEA. Now, FMEA does require a certain amount of expertise in the product you're looking at. This is because you have to be able to brainstorm all of the possible ways the product may fail. In addition, you will have to be able to think about the possible causes for those failures. Simply put, FMEA is much more effective when you are able to create a comprehensive list of failure modes. Once you have a pretty good idea of how your product or process is going to fail, you look at each mode individually and assess the risk. This is done by using a 1 to 10 scale for the severity of the problem, the probability the problem will occur, and the ease of detection. 
The next step is to multiply out those scores to create something called the RPN or Risk Priority Number. The number allows you to go after the right problems first. And keep in mind, that is part of the FMEA process. You have to actually develop an action plan to prevent the problems you have identified from occurring. The RPN lets you prioritize so you can go after the most troublesome issues first. To support the FMEA process, we recommend using the FMEA worksheet. Like most forms, the first thing you should do is fill out the header information. Start by noting the system, process, or product that you are reviewing. I also always like to see ownership in pretty much anything improvement related. Enter the name of the person who has responsibility for this FMEA worksheet. As you start, enter the page number you are on. Once you're finished, note the final tally. Looking down to the main body of this form, you may notice that the information blocks seem a bit cramped. Feel free to extend the size of the boxes as needed. The column on the left is a simple description of the issue. You will be transferring the items you identified during the brainstorming session to this column. Column number 2 is a description of how the failure will look. In column 3, record the impact of the failure. Next, record the root causes if you have identified them already. The next three columns are for your severity, occurrence, and detection scores. Multiply them out and put them into the RPN column. The next three columns provide you with a space to record what you're doing about each of these problems. You'll see an owner, status, and description of the actions. Finally, on the right-hand side of the form, you will record your results. Mark down what the RPN looks like after the countermeasures have been completed. As I mentioned earlier, the first thing you'll need to do in an FMEA is identify all the possible failure modes. Now when you do this, it is important to match the level of structure and sophistication of your FMEA to the needs of the project. A major product release that might find its way into the hands of millions of people probably requires a formal team with a highly experienced leader. Most of you watching this video, though, fall into a different category. You may be rolling out a new version of a part or creating a new process in a Kaizen event. The level of structure you need in that situation will not be quite as great. The general process remains the same, but the level of detail and the amount of work that goes into it will be quite different. Regardless of the scope of your project, you still need to think through how things can fail. That means both figuring out what can go wrong and what the impact of those problems will be. There is a balance here. You want to have enough failure modes identified that the prioritization step can do its magic, but you don't want to go overboard. Basically, I am just saying be realistic here. Scour your brain for possible ideas without allowing impossible or supernatural failure modes into the mix. It would just waste your time. That is because one of the more time-consuming parts of identifying failure modes is figuring out the root causes. You'll have to do a bit of research on each of the failure modes that you identify. You have to understand the root cause of the problem to make a good assessment as you start applying scores. As an example, I give presentations as part of live training. There are a variety of things that can go wrong. Let's say you decide to do an FMEA on the ways a projector can fail during a presentation. I might consider things like the bulb burning out, breaking the bulb during transit, forgetting a power cord, or a softer problem. I might even think about theft. I probably would not worry too much about earthquakes or floods, Intentional damage through vandalism is also unlikely. My point is that an FMEA is a lengthy process. Don't make it unbearably so. As part of the lean training system this video comes from, we offer a variety of lean LEGO training packages. These include our lean LEGO flow simulation, mistake-proofing or pokey oak lean LEGO exercise, and our visual controls and 5S lean LEGO exercise. We've also got an office flow simulation for those not implementing continuous improvement on the shop floor. Click the links in the description below 
or click on cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. Now that you have a thorough list of the potential problems you may face, it is time to look at each of them in more detail. You'll evaluate each problem in three categories. The first is the potential severity of the problem. Consider the impact of a failure. Obviously, death and injury are big problems. Problems that have a widespread impact should also be ranked more serious. Likewise, problems that are hard to correct would also receive a higher score. The second category is the likelihood of occurrence. The final category is how likely it is that you are able to detect the problem before it escapes to the customer. Score each of these categories on a 1 to 10 point scale. Some industrial project managers will create a system to score each category consistently, but it is more common to just make an estimate for each category. You can always adjust the scores if it ends up not making sense. This is most likely when the problems are scored by different people with a different ranking system. In addition, you may also see some people allowing only a 1, 3, and 9 point scores. It narrows the choices down to make the process simpler, but it also removes some nuance in scoring. With your three scores, you can now generate a single RPN or risk priority number. This lets you rank the scores and work on the most important ones first. Let's circle back to my projector example. One of the failure modes that I identified was that a bulb might burn out during class. The severity of the problem is not catastrophic. Nobody would get hurt, there would not be a lasting impact, and the cost to repair it would be minor. But the class would take a hit, possibly causing a cancellation. I give the severity a score of 6. Fortunately, bulbs have a pretty long life, and my projector records how many hours are on the bulb. I know when it is getting close to its end of life and replace them early. The chance of a bulb burning out in class is pretty low. I had a few go during the early stages of my career when bulbs were shorter lived, but that hasn't happened recently. I give it a 1 because it just isn't very likely. I score detection at an 8. I am looking at this from the perspective of knowing it is going to fail during a class, not that it did fail. Obviously, if the bulb goes out, I would notice. I'm more concerned with seeing the problem during prep or setup, and that is harder. With the scores I have given this problem, the RPN is 48. It probably comes as no great surprise that the first thing we do in this step is prioritize the problems we have identified. That does not necessarily mean that we are going to work on them in that order. Thanks for watching this extended free version of our Lean Training System module video. If you want to watch the whole video, check it out at Velaction Videos. If you want to make sure you don't miss the next LTS video that we post, please be sure to subscribe down below. We also always appreciate likes as it helps us get viewed more and makes us keep adding additional content. Thanks for watching and best wishes on your continuous improvement journey.